Let's get started. Welcome everyone to this afternoon's session of the Washington History Seminar, Historical Perspectives on International and National Affairs. This afternoon, we will be focusing on a new book by Columbia University historian, Victoria de Gracia, entitled The Perfect Fascist, A Story of Love, Power and Morality in Mussolini's Italy, published by Harvard University Press. I'm Eric Arneson from the George Washington University. I'm co-chair of the Washington History Seminar, along with my colleague, Christian Osterman of the Wilson Center. The seminar is a collaborative venture of the Woodrow Wilson Center's History and Public Policy Program and the American Historical Association's National History Center. And for the past decade, the seminar has been meeting weekly, usually on Mondays, and we've had a very full lineup of authors and books this season. And after today, we have three more sessions this fall before we launch into an equally full lineup in the winter and spring, a lineup that will be announced shortly. Behind the scenes, we'd like to thank two people who make these seminars possible, Pete Bierstecker of the Wilson Center and Rachel Wheatley of the National History Center. And our thanks as well to our institutional supporters, the LePage Center for History and the Public Interest and the George Washington University Department of History. Also thanks to any number of anonymous individual donors whose ranks, of course, as always, we invite you to join. On the logistics front, you should know today's session is being recorded and can soon be found on our institution's respective websites. And when we get to the question and answer section of the webinar, we ask those with questions to use the raise hand function on Zoom or the Q&A function. Those watching on Facebook Live can email their questions to Rachel Wheatley, whose email address will be posted in the chat function. We'll call on as many folks as we can. And with that, I turn over the screen to Christian Osterman, who will be moderating today's session. Christian. Thanks, Eric. Um, a warm welcome to everyone from me as well, especially, of course, to our panelists, Professor de Grazia, Professor Luzato, and Professor Chamedes. We have a really terrific panel uh, to talk about the perfect fascist, uh, Professor de Grazia's new book. Let me um, first introduce her, and she'll talk, uh, give us a a uh, little bit of a, of a synopsis of the book or highlights. Um, and then I'll introduce our two commentators who will engage in a conversation with Professor de Grazia, a conversation that we hope will involve many of our viewers as well, um, uh, a little ways into this session. Professor Victoria de Grazia is the Moore Collegiate Professor at Columbia University. She's the author of several works on consumer society and cultural uh, hegemony, including Irresistible Empire, published in 2005, The Sex of Things, published in 1996, and the forthcoming Soft Power Internationalism, 1990 to 2020, forthcoming next year. She's written two previous prize-winning history, histories of Italian fascism, the Culture of Consent, published in 1981, and How Fascism Ruled Women, Italy, 1920 to 1945, published in 1996. She was a founding member of the Radical History Collective, has won Fulbright, we're proud to say, Woodrow Wilson, American Academy in Rome, Guggenheim, and Jean Monnet Fellowships, and is a member of the American Academy of Arts and Sciences. It gives me a great pleasure to give her the Zoom room, or hand the Zoom room over to her now. Zoom room is yours. Thank you. Okay, I'm going to turn on my screen here and share it with you. Okay, first of all, let me thank you hugely, um, Christian, Eric, uh, Peter, uh, Rachel, for uh, hosting me. The seminar is very well known and you know, I was I was looking forward to being able to attend in person um, but the, the occasion is 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 just so um, and I want to thank also all, all the listeners uh, who have, are able to uh, participate and I want to then thank also of course Sergio and, and Juliana both colleagues and, and, and dear friends so, the question here is, let me just see if I can get this. Who is, who is this man, right? Mussolini uh, and this other fellow, 1938. This is the subject of my book, um, The Perfect Fascist. His name is 
Achilleo Tiruzzi, and he's born in 1882. That makes him the same age uh, as Mussolini. He served Mussolini perhaps the longest of anybody from 1920, organizer of the fascist squads in Milan, to 1943 as Minister of Italian Africa. He is one of the few men who achieved high positions in all of the apparatuses of the fascist regime, in the fascist party, the fascist mil militia, the Grand Council, deputy in three legislatures, and as colonial governor, army general, and cabinet mis minister. He was one of the most photographed men of the regime. He was a household name uh, by the 19, end of the 1930s. Many people spoke of him as Mussolini's friend, for better or for worse. He was uh, one of the few old guard fascists who joined Mussolini in the Italian uh, Social Republic under German occupation in September 1943. And he was in an armed convoy on the same route to flee from, to Switzerland as the Duce was in April 1945, uh, the one that led Mussolini to Mussolini's capture and execution by resistance forces um, uh, in April. He was the first major hierarch of the past regime to be tried by the purge courts in 1945. He would serve the longest time in prison of any hierarch. He was unique in having all of his property confiscated and he died just after his release in 1950. Now, all of that said, okay, I was not able to identify the man when I was first introduced to him. Uh, and that was in the context of being given an archive which had belonged to his estranged wife. That was about 15 years ago in New York City. Distant relatives of hers brought it to me. Um, her name was Liliana Weinman. She was a young opera singer, the only daughter of a Jewish manufacturer. Uh, Isaac, he's over, way, uh, over um, on the far uh, uh, left here. Um, she was studying in Milan when she met this Taruzzi. They uh, were immigrants to New York City from Jejo, which in 1899, when Liliana was born, was part of Austrian Galicia. The archive had uh, many photographs, uh, 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 in, like this one from the marriage album. Uh, it had uh, many photographs of uh, the fascist troops putting down uh, Libyan rebels. Uh, it had uh, uh, lots of packets of correspondence, and it had a, a big, long uh, annulment process uh, in it, volumes. Um, the uh, family wanted to know something that seemed you know, an interesting question, but also, you know, kind of tried and tr could lead to tried and true answers. Why this very intelligent young woman with a fabulous career opening up to her, it seemed, um, would have married this fascist, much older uh, and bearded. Now, to tell you the truth, she did seem like a very interesting person, and I couldn't tell about him because I did not initially recognize him. However, it also seemed to me from my training, <laughs> from my sense that fascism uh, had not been restudied, at least for my purposes, to understand um, the power of man and how relatively weak men cocoon themselves in power for long periods of time and how they try to reduce, reproduce themselves. Um, and uh, my skills led me to thinking, well, well, let's look for the man. And so I set out uh, to uh, uh, find out uh, about who this Taruzzi was. To my surprise, there was virtually nothing on him uh, and that only pressed me to try harder and harder, going, uh, working around Italy, go, even getting to the Jihad Center in uh, Tripoli, which held many kinds of resources on Italy to keep, uh, to keep moving. And what did I discover? Okay, first of all, Mussolini from the get-go, best man at the wedding. Here we see uh, the wedding reception. Right in the center, we see Liliana. Oops, excuse me, but let's try to go back here. There's the mother, there's the father, there's the bridegroom, kind of humble looking right there. Uh, there's uh, over here is Tulio Serafin, her mentor, uh, the director uh, uh, at uh, the, the Met, previously at La Scala, Toscanini's successor, and they're the ambassador, American ambassador and his wife, and his sister, a school, uh, school mistress. So an interesting family right, right, right off uh, in, uh, you know, it's in, in the suggestion that 
they had very powerful people as their witnesses. Who was he? I immediately went and found that he had been a colonial officer. Uh, here he is, uh, in completely inconspicuously, and indeed for his first 20 years of his life, he had been a very good soldier. That was you know, what, what appeared from digging around photographs, digging around army records, and so on and so forth, making his way up very slowly. Here he is in, 19, in, in Libya in 1914, just after a big battle, Battle of Maharuga, um, which was designed to try to, uh, to, to pacify the Fizan, something that would not happen until 1931. Uh, he won their bronze and civil medals. He was very, very active uh, and even impetuous in battle. We can see him right at the center here. He had been wounded and they're doing one of these typical acts trying to get the uh, Arab leaders, the Sanusi leaders to submit uh, a very, very difficult process. Here he is, an officer and a gentleman, Lieutenant. He had been at, uh, in, in the course of his career after volunteering, he had gained admittance to the uh, equivalent of, uh, the, uh, of, of West Point, that is the Academy of Modena, which showed that this was a striver, even coming from this very poor background in Milan, he was on the, the, uh, on the make, let's say, an officer and a gentleman with learning, acquiring all the skills and the beard and so on um, of the old officer corps. He turned out to be a very good officer in World War I. Uh, here he is as a captain, aide-de-camp of one of the great generals of the war, the emerging generals, General Bacardi, and another with another of the aides who happened to be uh, Raffaele Mattioli, who would eventually become one of the great bankers of Italy, two men clearly bound for very different outcomes. Right. Here, the question then is, one of the first questions I asked him, which drove it, how did this man become a fascist? In some sense, that answer isn't that interesting. Uh, coming back, uh, a major in the war, uh, going into the reserves, he's facing you know, nothingness in effect. You know, no jobs, wasn't gonna get a sinecure in the, in the railroads, that's what could have been expected. And the country um, completely turned topsy-turvy as he saw it in hands of the enemy. Okay, we'll come back to that question as how a military officer of his level, rank very high in, in, in the lower officer court would turn, come over and that would make him uh, unusual. Okay, but for the rest, we're gonna be seeing him here on the March on Rome as a striver, uh, as somebody who is moving, impetuous man, but that also got into trouble, very close to Mussolini mediocre, many would comment on him, and loyal. And so the question remains as we see him moving through, and I'm not going to go through the entire narrative, that it is the narrative of the book, is strive, uh, grasp, overreach, and fall, it has a kind of sense of a classic sort of tragic uh, uh, narrative, which almost entirely coincides uh, with the history of Italian fascism, the way it, the dynamic of its operation down to 1943, and then he stays with it another two years uh, to fall fully in 1945. So close that many people thought he was one of the people hung up alongside of Mussolini in Piazza Loreto, uh, it executed by the partisans in 1945. So here we see him at the end, the Minister of Italian Africa, at the great apogee of his power, and here finally we see him after he was purged and in penitentiary where he's still a very loyal person, but now his loyalty has been transformed from Bacardi, his general uh, during the war, to Mussolini, and now he was attached very closely to the prison chaplain, who was clearly the highest in the day-to-day -day life uh, hierarchy of the prison. Okay, now, what uh, I have been addressing here, because it's a narrative, I can't say, hey, there's a thesis out there in the way I would do with my, my, my previous books and way historians like to, to speak. But there are certain themes that came through which led me to subtitle it, Love, 
power and morality. And usually in the past, I would have said between and you know, so how are they related to each other? It's hard to say exactly how they're related to one another, but to me, I, they, they tell a great deal about fascism. So love, that question, love, oh my goodness, how much love appears in this story. And yet I couldn't really say it's a history of emotions because in fact, it was entirely conditioned, I found, uh, by uh, being under and during and through the fascist regime. So and then in my index on the entry of love found uh, that love between comrades, love between Jews and Gentiles, love as coup de foudre, love as Eros and Thanatos for family, free love for Italy, Lili on his idea of, for Mussolini, Mussolini's idea of love, Teruzzi idea and so on and so forth. Okay, and then there has to be other kinds of entries for um, sexual conduct and so on and so forth. Okay, love. Okay. It, Robert Paxson had made the point that he could only find intense passion as being sort of a central theme, uh, and it's not clear if it's a trope, a subject, but there is no question that there is a special love under fascism. Uh, it was captured in, the, in 1941 very well by uh, uh, Du Rougemont, who spoke of the way Hitler had transformed sacred love uh, uh, for the nation, which he said came out of Christianity, to love for him. Very sort of simple idea, but that did come through in, in this work. When Mussolini had no program at the founding convention of the fascist party, he spoke that the party was unified by love, like St. Francis, who married himself to poverty and loved it every day more and more. And so he vowed uh, uh, to embrace Italy's adored mother and to love her every day more and more. And when he declares a dictatorship in his famous speech of January 3rd, 1925, he wraps it up saying Italy wants peace, tranquility, and calm industriousness with love if possible and with force if necessary. Okay. I am driven neither by personal caprice, he said, nor by love of power, nor by a noble passion, but solely by strong and boundless love for the fatherland. And it would be switched around in various ways. There is no question that uh, Ceruzzi regarded himself at some points as Calaf, you know, conquering the ice princess, that both of them confused hugely their love for one another with their love for Mussolini, for their, with their love for power, with their love, they said, for, for their homeland and to be able to serve it. Uh, and um, it, likewise, uh, he, he faced the constantly the problem of family love. He himself uh, saying, "Shall we? Do I, do I love my leader more than my family?" And in the case of her, that led to hear him renouncing her. But then he had to face also that he had another family with his daughter, and at the very end of the regime there were fascists who were making these choices. Do I continue with the regime or do I stay with my family? Do I love Mussolini or do I love the nation? So this is not just a trope, but even in terms of a kind of social action, love as a very important place in the story. Power, okay, Let's take that a step further. Power is a huge word, but I found that this book of the study did illuminate some things which I think would probably have to be worked on more. Teruzzi came out of the military. He's a major, he's not a general. Okay? And he was at, had been at war in Libya for that policing operations in Eritrea. But when I went and began to trace him at war, found that this regime was really almost always at war or engaged in major policing actions. And to my surprise, fascist, the history of fascism only talks about war in 35, but then war alongside of Mussolini in 1940. When Mussolini is really very clear, aside from his own war experience and the anti-subversive war that he fought in, between 1919 and 1922 against the left, and he very, it clearly is expressing himself from 1925 in the need for an ongoing kind of Darwinian war it, for Italy, not just to sustain itself as a second rate great power, uh, but uh, to not fall lower and perhaps to rise higher 
uh, in the, the, the European hierarchy. And, and Cerruzzi's role in this was very, sometimes it's said as an enforcer or as an informer or as a factotum, but he was very much the aide de camp, I think, uh, a figure that Mussolini had no familiarity with, but which he was always has the qualities of the aide de camp, the utter loyalty. Yes, it also means informing, it means enforcing, it means being very reserved, it means constant contact, and he was always the major moving around the lines, moving around the lines, knowing people, uh, telling, you know, gossiping about them, uh, relating, and an aspect of Mussolini's power, which can't be quite described as polycratic. We don't have the words that we have for the studying German, uh, Germany under Hitler, and that's, uh, you know, I think still a, pro a problem, is that he's part of this coterie around Mussolini, which is lasting. He's the only one that remains from the co very compromised group in Milan all the way to the end. And he uses his sort of what he calls his centaur instinct, half animal, half man, speaking of Mussolini, to judge by their reactions, this continuum of people around him, some very smart and very highly educated, one thinks of Ferrizzoni in the 1920s, Botai in the 1930s, others like his son-in-law, but these are all uh, this relatively small group of which Teruzzi is a part, even though he's denigrated as being not very smart, mediocre, mediocre is the word that's being used, play a very important role in sort of playing back uh, and forth. And when that group ends in 1940, and Teruzzi himself is, tends to be uh, pushed away after 1940, Mussolini, certainly his instincts no longer work uh, at all effectively. So Chiruzzi then, mediocre but loyal, very loyal, a beautiful fascist face, plays this role then as part of a, a collectivity uh, operating around Mussolini and in, in many ways providing him then with a kind of sounding board for uh, his, 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 his uh, you know, very significant political capacity. Finally, okay, and I'm gonna go through here so we can see here, um, Teruzzi uh, is the undersecretary of the home ministry. That is, it's, he's in charge of the prefects of policing under uh, Federzoni, 1925-1926. Uh, he's right in the center there, all dressed up, looking like a statesman, he changes uniforms. He's very capable of doing that, going, becoming a sort of uh, adapting to different roles. Here we see him, excuse me, as governor of uh, Saranaica because what he was had this colonial officer, even if it was fairly low level background, that's his wife right in the middle. And there we see him now as the aide de camp. In effect, he's not, he's, he's chief of the militia uh, with Mussolini and there's his old general, Vacardi, who's uh, at that point was head of the Presidium of Rome on maneuvers. So he acts as a kind of go between, between the regular army and the fascist militia. And here we see him leader of men, very good at morale raising during the Ethiopian war. He's the only <laughs> general who comes out of the uh, division. And here we see him uh, at, with generals uh, Balbo and uh, 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 Badoglio. Here we see him with Franco on mission in 1936, uh, excuse me, 37 to the Spanish uh, war. And here we see him now in Africa where he's a conduit, not only for uh, uh, all kinds of power going into Africa, corporate, military, and so on, but also for sort of bringing back a sense that Mussolini would be informed of how the, the, the empire is operating. Okay. Finally, this question of morality. Oh my goodness, that's a big question. It sounds like an oxymoron even. But indeed, Mussolini, of course, claimed to be moral and ethical. Uh, and, you know, I think we don't have to believe it in that sense, but it does sort of make us wonder ab about how to think about fascism and morality without, with, without uh, you know, uh, feeling nauseous and, and, or, or treating it as something that's order, utterly incompatible, which the fascists never did, and of course neither did, 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 did the Nazis. Mussolini, um, you, you know, sort of, um, 
is it famously Machiavellian, that's true, but it's a Machiavelli that's always sort of weighing uh, what it indeed is the, the, the needs of the state and if the state's priority is war making, and then uh, that indeed will be the, you know, the, the, the ethical priority uh, to uh, win wars. It's certainly a very bioethical approach to morality, a very manipulative uh, vision of how individuals will fit into it. But nonetheless, the fascists were sustaining that they, uh, especially in the beginning, that you know, Mussolini in the wake of the Matteotti crisis, the death, the assassination of, of, of Matteotti in 1924, that he is taking moral responsibility uh, for it. So there is a notion of a fascist morality, um, which comes out of duty to the nation, uh, and uh, which is sort of built up then with some chivalric and other notions. Okay. Uh, at, the same at the same time, it's in a Catholic country, and, the, and it indeed becomes theocratic in some ways after the, uh, the, the, the Concordat, the Accords with the Vatican in 1929, marriage in particular as the foremost sacrament becomes under, the, under Italian law, indissoluble except through church courts, that is through church law. And we can see here, okay, if, if Mussolini is over in the previous one, standing over like God, the, the Duomo of Milan. Here we can see the power of the, the court system of the Catholic Church, the power of suasion. This is not the Pope, Pius the 11th. This is Cardinal Schuster uh, uh, at, at, at the, uh, the, the Archbishop also of Milan with his court, which signals in, in this image, the, the great power there. And Teruzzi has to pass through it. And that is not simply a process of law, but also a moral process in, insofar as the fascists are trying to corrupt the court. And finally, uh, we have this image of uh, Teruzzi himself. But any moral, any normal moral categories, this man is a libertine. He may be worse. He may be a pedophile, according to gossip. Uh, he is known as a womanizer. Mussolini has to intervene on repeated occasions to get him out of trouble, especially with with, with women uh, or with showing up with gangs of men around him, which create an image that they are uh, uh, predatory uh, and, uh, and, and corrupt and dancing while in uniform. This notoriety will, will become in the form of payback that he will be called uh, a notorious parasite the wrecker of the vampire of the empire, famous for his corruption. And that will stand when in fin finally he's also condemned by the courts, this notion of him as a libertine. Whether he was more so than others, it's very hard to, to say. Okay. But for me, the moral question finally rests around the relationship with the Nazis and the recognition that as of 1940, more and more, the fascists are out of their league in their relations, their fawning admiration, their slavishness uh, in terms of politics and in terms of military projects with respect to um, the Nazis. Uh, if the notion of the sovereign's moral uh, bearings bears most on the fact of being able to save his people, uh, which was the, the sort of fundamental notion uh, of, of, of around Mussolini's sovereignty, then clearly the relationships, these self illusions and narcissism around the relationships with fascists, uh, not between Nazis and fascists, and especially on an individual male level. Here we have Teruzzi uh, with von Epp uh, bringing him to the opera, courting him, this kind of obsequiousness. Here we have another image of this obsequiousness when he, the return visit when Teruzzi goes uh, to um, to Berlin and had, had you know, the preens uh, uh, reviewing the Gross Deutschland Regiment on its return from France uh, in 1943, uh, excuse me, in, 40, in, um, in, in 1940 after the conquest of France. But finally, I want to finish here is the relationship 
with his family. And that's where the question of the moral bearings really comes to, to pass. Uh, he uh, had as a second um, great love in 1937. He couldn't get a divorce, uh, his marriage dissolved. A young woman, another young woman, another young Jewish woman, not from the United States, but from Cairo, uh, traveling on a Romanian passport. Uh, he has a child with her in 1938. She's Jewish. And as the Jewish laws are put into effect, no matter how uh, he uh, much he favors getting getting uh, uh, condoning certain um, Jews, um, no matter his views on, uh, and, on on Jews, which are anti-Semitic utterly, and at the same time saying not that Jew, but this Jew and so on and so forth, cutting and dicing. He is faced under German occupation once more with the fact that he does have this woman who's is stateless as well as Jewish uh, with a child illegitimate and therefore what to do. And in some ways, the final story of his fall and his moral feelings rest around what happens to her and to his family. So this is a, you know, a, a narrative. It's very much about fascism uh, and my, my sort of judgments about uh, the fascist regime generally, but let's sort of wound through that where in the ways that only a marriage can illuminate. There is this tragic story, if you want, of the, 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 the marriages of this man, this perfect fascist uh, who end up with two Jewish wives, uh, one he couldn't divorce and the other he couldn't uh, marry. Thank you, Professor de Grazia. If you could uh, minimize or yeah, take off the screen share. Excellent, wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, as mentioned, we have the privilege of two um, wonderful commentators and we'll start with um, Sergio Luzato. Uh, professor Luzato is professor at the Emiliana Pasca Noether Chair in Modern Italian History at the University of Connecticut. He was born in Italy, received his PhD from the Scuola Normale Superiore in Pisa, as well as from the Ecole des Autitudes in Paris. Before joining Yukon, he taught for almost 20 years at the University of Turin as a full professor in European modern history. He has four monographs on French history and more relevant to today's subject. Three of his books deal with Italian history, the Body of Il Duce, published in 2005, Padre Pio, 2010, and Primo Levi's Resistance, published in 2016. They have been translated into English by Metropolitan Books. His book on Padre Pio won the Kandel History Prize in 2011. Since 2001, he has been a regular contributor to, and to the cultural pages of some of Italy's, of Italy's leading newspapers and his Latest monograph, the Holocaust-related uh, I Bambini di Marche, 2018, is due for translation into English by Yad Vashem Publications in Jerusalem. He has edited, together with our featured speaker, the two-volume Dictionary of Fascism, and his current research project deals with the history of terrorism in Italy mm. from the late 1960s to the early 1980s. He is reaching us all the way from Italy, so it's late hour there. We're delighted to have you with us. Sergio, the uh, Zoom room is yours. Thank you, Kristen. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, thank you. So uh, uh, thank you to you and thank you to you all. It is really a privilege to uh, uh, be in here for me, uh, not only because of uh, the egregious reputation of the Wilson Center, but particularly because uh, of uh, this uh, magisterial book we are talking about. And I don't think, uh, you know, the very close friendship I have with the Victoria de Grazia uh, somehow prevents me from, uh, from being able to uh, judge how important this book is. And uh, uh, in, in many ways, uh, the author herself writes that this is not a biography and, uh, and she defines it as the social history of a man. And I do think that this is a social history that he, you know, 
highest at the highest possible level. Uh, it's uh, also the biography of, uh, as uh, Victoria said and reminded us, a very mediocre man. And I think that somehow this is, makes the book even more important because uh, uh, somehow this we, we are confronted to a character which is representative of fascism in its very mediocrity. Uh, and uh, uh, the Graz already said how surprisingly this uh, character has been overlooked, uh, whereas it provides a very instructive fil rouge in the history of fascism. Mm -hmm. uh, any, every single moment of his biography is instructive in terms of what you know, the fascist has been, not only in, in the history of Italy, but uh, throughout the history of the 20th century, or at least it's, its first half. And that is really the relationship with World War I and uh, the, how the fascist, uh, you know, the, the seizure of power by, by fascism, uh, fascist normalization, the relationship of fascists with Africa, and the very concept of Euro Africa, which this guy somehow embodies, and uh, uh, the collaboration, the, the issue of you know how Italians ended up or you know somehow were promised since the very beginning to be the the not the best possibly ally, but eventually the the the, the most important ally of 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 uh, Hitler's Germany, and the, the relationship with, to to uh, to, uh, to to the Jewish. Uh, question through uh, personal links because as uh, Victoria reminded us this man basically had two wives although you know just one uh, officially and both were, were Jewish so uh, what a choice of a character to write uh, uh, a social to, to try to write a social uh, history of a man and uh, uh, I think uh, our author Victoria de Gazza was you know the the, the the best suited person to to take such an endeavor, for for many reasons, uh, because she has been uh, for most of her life uh, a social historian uh, and a cultural historian uh, of of Italy, uh, because she's a specialist in in women history and in in gender history or attitudes, etc. So she was somehow you know in, in a very good place to uh, to work to make a marriage and such a kind of various marriage in terms of, of the identities of, of the, of the two, uh, two persons at stake, uh, the, the matter of, of a book. And also because she is a, a specialist of the relationship between America and American history and, and continental Europe history uh, uh, and the images, the, 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 the mutual images of the, of the two cultures. Uh, and uh, uh, she was not, to the best of my knowledge, a specialist of, of African uh, of the conquest of Africa by 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 the Italians, or but she she, she became a very authoritative uh, specialist even in this subfield, and I'm very admirative of what she uh, she did uh, at that level. So this is a, a a very original I think book. It's a pioneering uh, endeavor, and uh, of course I think one of the the main contributions, or at least one of the main uh, you know uh, endeavors that this book uh, entails it is the idea of, you know, instead of just uh, forgetting about morality under, under fascist rule, to take it as, as uh, to put it at the center of, of, of the stage, so to speak. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm quoting here by, from, you know, De Grazia introductory pages, this book takes us behind the facade of fascist totalitarianism and into the private life and moral compromise of one of its most exemplary food soldiers. And then she goes on writing uh, as a kind of, you know, synopsis of, 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 her, of the whole approach, fascist Italy, I think these are very powerful lines, fascist Italy was horrible, but full of hearts. So, you know, to, 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 to be short on the, on the different merits of, of this book, I think that these, these might be the, the, some of the main points I would make about it. Uh, this said, are we here to uh, uh, congratulate uh, Victoria de Grazia or to discuss her book? I think, uh, you know, the latter. So I, I, uh, you invi kindly invited us to, uh, to ask the questions to our, our uh, 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 keynote speaker or to our guest or whatever you may want to call it. I do have a couple of questions for, for Victoria de Grazia. 
the first one being, do you really think that this book shows, quote, that fascist Italy was horrible, but full of heart? And that is, where do you see any heart in this story? Hmm. Uh, I, you know, I was, as, as you know, I, I have been going through this book with, uh, with special attention uh, since, uh, you know, I, I had the privilege of, of, of being able to re read the, the, the manuscript of it prior to, to its publication. And I'm still struggling to find any heart in this story. Hmm. Uh, did Bertoluzzi ever love? Liliana, I wonder. You wonder as well, Victoria. And uh, at, the, at the end of this book, you say, you write that somehow, uh, you know, he, he chose her because, I quote here, uh, she, she appeared to be the perfect wife, which, you know, we may wonder what, you know, are, are you meaning by that? But, but I understand that in the 20s, a woman coming from the States and from a wealthy family in the, in the, in, in the States still could appear as a perfect white to a kind of uh, fascist, uh, you know, not yet hierarch, hierarch as Teruzzi was uh, by, the mid, uh, by the mid 20s. So do you really think he loved her? And uh, uh, did ever Liliana love Teruzzi? Uh, Why don't we give a I, chance? I really wonder. And, and uh, you, you have been, uh, sorry? Uh, you have been doing this wonderful work on her, you know, personal papers, and you know, I I think she she basically I, I think she she never loved loved him, but she was very, you know, taken by the idea of becoming a princess, uh, you know, the the wife of the governor, etc. Cetera, etc. Cetera. So this is my first question: where 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 do where do you find any heart in this uh, in this story? My second question: Hold on, do you say, really say, think says you, says you. Uh, Let's let's yeah. let's allow uh, Professor De Grazia to respond to your first question. So uh, it's, a, it's a wonderful question, I suppose. Horrible but full of heart. I mean, it's a it's a response in some way to <laughs> this is a big picture. Hannah Arendt's notion that there are not uh, you know a, 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 a wide range of emotions, however bent. So the full of heart would mean the emotional. Uh, intensity, it could mean the possibilities of relations, did, they were both swept away. In other words, I think that there is a sweeping away uh, in, in which the, the, the couple felt, and this would come back in the 1930s, the swept awayness of the second young women, that so much of emotions were, were, were being conditioned by the, the intensity of living and especially by a Teruzzi um, who, who was parading around in his uniform. And so it's always going to be viewed as, you know, the man in uniform and with all of the kinds of connotations about sexuality, um, uh, sort of slightly sadistic, being part of the man and therefore to be conquered. This is a man who was in, in, often in the eyes of women because he was weak, because he was needy, um, and, and because he was relatively attractive and part of, of, of this apparatus. So it's on both sides. It's very hard to judge, do people really love each other? Many people said that they loved each other. You know, they were always you know, touching each other, even sometimes in photographs, so that's kind of rare. Um, he, he said in his letters breaking up that his heart was broken, to have to do this and so on. So, you know, you take that, that it, lo love is a very variable thing, right? She's trickier. She's, a, you know, a major narcissist and, you know, he loved her parents, especially. And she, it was trickier. But love, and these are all stories of love stories. It's filled with love stories. And, you know, one can, uh, you know, sort of say, what does that mean? You know, Eros and Thanatos, I think there's a complexity here where the obstacles are always getting in the way of the marriages and the love stories which are created by these people as part of a kind of acting out of, uh, of passion in what de Rougemont calls the European sense, you know, that it's not Hollywood type love where they live happily ever after, to be real love, to match the love that Teruzzi feels towards his hierarchs, the general on the field, who he speaks of as loving, or to, speaking of Mussolini, that he loves him, or 
um, you know, the, 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 the that he, it, it, it really is his love of the nation, his love of the dead. He always speaks, whenever he speaks about needing to love, it's the love of those who've died. So this is a, a love, Eros and Thanatos, that's full of heart, even if we don't think of it that way, because, hey, we're bourgeois, and we think of our families as key, and our, the way we love our families as key. But that's a notion of love. And this, you know, ha has a much greater amplitude, which harks back to chivalric traditions, uh, which fascism is using because they were part of the male military model. It harks back to love of nation in that kind of 19th century patriotic, but also reactionary sense. That's, that's love, that's pure, <laughs> just may not, be, be a killer for people. It, and it harks back to love of your comrades who are about to die. And that's love. You know, men in the trenches, they, they say they love each other. And that keeps being repeated, well, especially by Teruzzi. That's a kind of love. It isn't, and it goes against, and it's contradictory, and especially in this poor, pathetic man, you know, between his love of family, which never succeeds, and his willingness to throw himself into fire, even with his child, ultimately. That's a terrible thing against the partisans. And then, you know, march, keep marching on. So, you know, model of the, the, you know, the warrior father male, which, you know, we've, it's, it's, a, it's like, Sergio, you, we wouldn't believe in love in Verdi operas. It's so distant, and it's, but it has that same kind of quality. Thank you. Sergio, back to you for a second question. Yeah, yeah. Thank you for this, uh, you know, very, very interesting and wonderful and uh, uh, sensitive, I think, uh, uh, and sensible answer. Uh, and my second question is related to the first one, uh, and that is, you know, again, quoting Victoria. Um, do, do you really think that this book shows or attests to, to quote? fascism overwhelming preoccupation with virility, which engendered a distinctive, distinctive set of problems. And that is, I want to, I, I would like to invite you to, 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 to tell us more about the ways you think that this, uh, you know, morality, morality play, so to speak, is, in, is, is, is instructive in terms of, of virilism and, and uh, the specificity of, of, of uh, uh, sexual politics uh, in Italy under the fascist regime. To, to be frank with you, I don't think that this is particularly represented of, of, uh, of uh, 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 a kind of distinctiveness of fascist uh, uh, virility. Well, uh, in a footnote of this you know, important and, and long book, you, you never talk about Berlusconi, you never write about Berlusconi in the, in the text. But you do have a footnote about on, on Berlusconi in the end notes, and you know you somehow compare her, their uh, sexual appeal of, of Mussolini to the one of, of Berlusconi. And this, when I read that end note, I I was reminded of you know Berlusconi's wife Veronica Lario, and uh, how they you know ultimately they, they divorced. Do you really think that you know she, she gave up? Veronica Lario gave up with her career of as an actress to become Mussolini's wife. Uh, sorry, Berlusconi's wife, uh, and ev evidently because she was interested in uh, in power and in the way you know a woman can be can you know get or access power through a man. And uh, as a matter of fact, somehow even you know in current uh, present day America, uh, 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 you know up to up to into in, in the White House. You do have, you know, example of a person giving up her career, or, or, or a woman, I mean, or, uh, to to and you know just to become the wife of a of a powerful man. So, uh, uh, are, are you really? Uh, of course, I mean, I agree. Of you know everything you said about fascism. This is a, almost a kind of a, a paradox. But how would you say that this story of uh, of uh, uh, Liliana is different from the story of most? women who are interested in power and very ready to give up about other, you know, um, projects they have mm -hmm. uh, just to be entitled to live close to power. Mm -hmm. Well, that, I mean, it's a good 
a, go <laughs> a good question. I, I mean, I sort of hoped it would be a central question that to my surprise, and I hope to readers' surprise, but we'll be, we'll, we'll let the readers <laughs> say what they think. Women were everywhere. So this book, which started out to be about fascist manhood, uh, ends up to being about, hey, there are women everywhere. And there are women everywhere acting in terms of their interest and identity. And they, uh, Truzzi has many young lovers. And it's hard to know who they are, but I've got a few letters which Liliana stole, so I have them. And there they are, they're asking, you know, they love him, they miss him physically, they miss him emotionally, and they're also asking for him to help their fathers and their brothers' careers, and later their own careers, getting licenses. So in that sense, a little like the Berlusconi model, okay? So this is, you know, giving and taking. Liliana is problematic because she's kind of a power monger who's confused. Uh, by all of this excitement occurring around her and that this man is part of it. And so she has a very clear project to get into Mussolini's inner circle and to advance this man. And she thinks of this as a commercial trade-off in some way. She's giving up X, but she's not really, she thinks she can still go back to the stage probably, you know, and maybe even better if she becomes a Catholic, like some Catholic Irish, uh, Irish <laughs> baritones that she cites in a flippant way. Um, and she is, is constantly managing as if she were, you know, trying to make it in the inner circle in New York City. So she's very particular in that way. But all of the women clearly have interests in, in getting a protector. And that structure continues in a society under Berlusconi. I mean, there's no question that about <laughs> just a, that maybe the beautiful actress marries Berlusconi because of all the power that would come up for her. And she wasn't a very successful actress. And so I spent a lot of time asking, well, would Liliana have been a success? You know, made her way. It seems so. She was seen to have capacities from her mentors. You know, it's hard for me to judge, but I try to ask uh, opera coaches, things like that, to try to get me, you know, how good was this woman? How good was she? That she had a mentor, Tullio Serafin, who was also later Callas's mentor and Poncel's mentor. I mean, this is a man who thought enormously of her, uh, that she would have success, maybe not at the Met, but certainly success. So that was sort of this weighing she doesn't, I mean, she's confused. She recognizes later, it was like Alice in Wonderland. She was clueless. How could she have been so ingenuous, she says, you know, to have made that, that trade-off. She didn't recognize how weak this man was. She, 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 didn't, she didn't get it. She admits that. But other women are getting a lot out of him. Our, our close friend, um, a colleague, Claudio Pavone, he mentioned, oh, yes, he remembered he was 20 or so years old in Rome in the 1940s. He said, ah, you know, if a woman opened an art gallery, they said, ah, she must be one of Teruzzi's friends. So he was very well known as sponsor for sponsoring young women, which with all, frankly, that went along with it that we know about, and which very recently he's been denounced by the Me Too movement. But trust me, it was everywhere, universities, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, that young women use older men who are of power to get where they wanted to go. So, you know, that, that, uh, that, that none of this in some sense surprised me. What could is surprising that Chiruzzi was regarded as somebody who you could rely on. Again, another anecdote, I know we shouldn't go too, too far here. Anna Magnani was famous. Anna Magnani's son, uh, boyfriend was picked up by the police, uh, uh, picked up by the military recruiters, and he was about to be taken away because he should have been reported for duty. She rushes to Ruzzi and says, can't you do something? Teruzzi does something, but chastises them both saying they were dishonorable in terms of their loyalty to the nation and their duty to the nation. So he was well known for helping and at the same time, you know, he was ogling, touching, you know, if they would become his lovers, that was part of the game. The difference between that and, you know, a Berlusconi regime, no, this, this is part of a continuity of structure uh, where politicians have clientele and women are clientele, especially in 
moments where they don't have other access. Now, the other thing about the specialness, of, sorry, about fascists and virility, yeah, I'm not sure that I wanted to really be, I was always uncomfortable with this being history of man, of man, gender, history of man. I believe in gendering all men all the time, you know, whatever whatever moment they, they exist, whatever power capacity. Uh, and I believe that that leads to a lot of interesting things. But the fascist regime, no question in the 1920s, and we can see this in this history, the women are there, the families are there, they're around. Okay. There's still an uncertainty whether this is gonna be a bourgeois regime, like Franco's regime, where the women are active, and you have soirees and so on. You're gonna create that kind of compactness. And radically in 1929, Mussolini moves to another model, which is all men. And where the salon recedes as a moment where the fascists and their wives get together. And so there is quite a shift over in terms of their place. Uh, and this is exactly the moment when, Muss when his, his Liliana is booted out. Mussolini's famous lover, intellectual companion, Sarfati is forced to leave, and all the fa women fascists are pushed pushed away. So it becomes an all male hierarchy with with a, a huge amount of militarization in, involved in it, and the families sort of become sort of secondary. Uh, at, were, were, were dealt with in terms of baptisms, marriages, and funerals, and Teruzzi is unusual. He's very present at all of those occasions, also because he doesn't have his own wife, so he has a lot of free time on his hands to be familistic uh, as we represent the regime. Thank you. Let's bring Juliana into the conversation. Um, before I do that, let me remind our viewers to use the raised hand function or the Q&A functionality to uh, get lined up for any questions you may have or those who are viewing us on Facebook Live, please email Rachel Wheatley at rwheatley at historians.org. We're very fortunate to have another uh, distinguished um, commentator with us today, Juliana Chamedes, who is the Mellon Morgridge Professor of European International History at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. She completed her MPhil in European history at the University of Cambridge and a PhD at Columbia University. Her first book, A 20th Century Crusade, The Vatican's Battle to Remake Christian Europe, came out with Harvard University Press last year and won the Michael Hunt Prize in International History, um, as well as the Mararo Prize. Her work has been published in the Journal of Contemporary History, Contemporary European History, French Politics, culture and society and in numerous edited volumes. She has received support for research from the American Council of Learned Societies, the Mellon Foundation, and the DID, among others. She's currently drafting her second book, tentatively entitled, Failed Globalists, European Socialists, Decolonization, and the Decline of Welfareism, 1973 to 2008. Juliana, welcome, and um, floor is yours. Christian, thank you so much for that very generous introduction. And thank you and Eric for this invitation. It's such a pleasure to be here on the virtual floor with Vicky and Sergio as well. So I'm going to start off with a little bit of an anecdote from my teaching and then um, talk talk a bit about Vicky's book before uh, Vicky, I ask you my, my two questions and I probably will bundle them just for the interest of time here. So, <clears throat> I teach on the history of Italian fascism, and many of my students come into my classes with one key nagging question. And I try to explain, you know, in the course of the classes, why this messy multi-form political movement seized power in 1922, how it did so, how it undid democracy, how it endured for two decades, how it served as a model for far right-wing movements worldwide, well beyond the curtain call of World War II. But after all of my many, many hours of classes, my students still aren't satisfied and they basically return to the question that they started with at the very beginning of class, which was, how is it, which was and is, how is it that ordinary people could get behind fascism, a movement that was clearly so toxic and so destructive? Um, this troubles them especially because 
Um, most of my students still believe in the fundamental goodness of human beings. So this question becomes kind of all the more pressing for them, right? And um, after all, as Vicky's book clearly shows, it's not as though destruction was a hidden component of the fascist project. Right after World War I, this newborn militia style movement torched socialist party and newspaper headquarters. It forced left-wing activists to drink castor oil and um, tortured and terrorized those it considered enemies of Italy. Once in power, of course, you know, Mussolini institutionalized the militias, banned opposition political parties, banned freedom of speech and of the press, and proudly inaugurated what uh, was in many, many ways a regime of terror. So again, you know, this question that my students have, how could ordinary people stomach it or worse still go along as willing accomplices? And I feel that finally, after all of these years of reading about fascism, we have a book that answers this question and that it does so with extraordinary care and sensitivity and elegance. And it does much more than this too, but I'm going to focus on this one um, point in my comments. In, in this book, in this extraordinary book, Vicky de Grazia shows how an ordinary man, an altogether ordinary man, Attilio Terruzzi, who was born to a working class family in Milan, could go on to become Mussolini's right hand man as elected deputy, as militia leader, as a builder of fascism's overseas empire. And she also shows how he dragged the two women he loved most down with him. Uh, the Perfect Fascist is an unusual book because it is at once an absolute delight to read and it is brimming with a flurry of deep historical insights that allow us to understand fascism, I think, in a really a quite new way. De Grazia shows that fascism's power lay not only or primarily in its instruments of coercion, but in its ability to build consent burrowing deep down into an individual's innermost sense of morality, of justice, and of truth, and of truth, excuse me. It's a familiar trope to scholars of totalitarianism that fascism is the first of the political movements that really blurs the line between public and private spheres. But I think what De Grazia shows is that fascism did far more than this. It kind of carried within itself an epistemological and ethical revolution that transformed how its followers saw the world and cast themselves as upright moral agents within that world. It also does more in a pretty unsettling fashion, I think. It shows how fascism got under the skin because it was able to take advantage of so many human emotions and traits that are universal. Uh, traits like ambition, jealousy, paranoia, yearning for camaraderie, uh, and the desire to change the world for the better, right? Kind of the most disturbing one of them all um, when we think of it in terms of fascism. As we follow the journey of Attilio Terruzzi from nobody to a fascist star, De Grazia upends our standard understandings because rather than presenting fascism as a kind of uh, strange parenthesis in the famous phrase of Benedetto Croce, she shows how fascism, like Terruzzi, in fact, was as unextraordinary as it was cruel, as mundane as it was deeply malignant. Fascism's contradictory qualities also lodge themselves within individual lives. And I think she does a terrific job of showing this too. So for instance, through the poignant story of how the fascist regime destroyed the two women that Teruzzi loved most, De Grazia gives us an intimate picture of what it meant to be Jewish in Mussolini's Italy and how a country defined from 1929 at least, at once by the Lateran agreements with the Catholic Church and by the fascist regime, came to see itself as a defender of Catholicism, casting outsiders away as enemies, even the most faithful of out, uh, insider outsiders. Um, at the same time, De Grazia shows that there was sort of a mess going on. There was no Ur script to rely on. The regime was inconsistent in its application of the so-called race laws. So too was the Catholic Church in its application of church law to cases of marriage annulment, which is, you know, as she mentioned, a core issue breached in the book. Despite the fact that um, fascism repeatedly breaks apart his loves, Teruzzi remains faithful to it. Um, and therefore, you know, a perfect fascist, as De Grazia says. 
De Grazia does something else that is surprising and necessary. Um, she shows that, you know, instead of all of the focus on the Hitlers and the Mussolinis, again, something that, you know, many folks come to fascism very much obsessed by, she shows us that it's really important and necessary to shift the emphasis to these individuals who basically were completely unexceptional, and that the power of fascism lay not only in coercion and in ideology or in rather kind of coarse grained indoctrination instruments, but in its capacity to turn the everyday stuff of human emotions into a tool for fascism's advancement and aggrandizement. Um, I'll just close with saying this, which is um, that this book I think is, is so important for another reason too. It's no secret that we're living in very dark times um, and we've, grown accustomed, I think, in these very dark times to very dark stories. Um, we've got a kind of cottage industry now on the question of, you know, how fascism pertains to understanding our historical present. There's some great work there. Um, but in many of those works, fascism is typically narrated from quite a distance and as the story of one bleak horror after another. And I think Vicky de Gretz's book has the singular virtue of not going down that path. She does not hide the regime's crimes and the extreme violence it meted out. But in a deeply refreshing way, she also celebrates beauty. It's the beauty of the landscapes and places that Teruzzi inhabited, the beauty of the poetry written at the time he lived, the beauty of the people he met. It's not just a physical beauty, but a deeper one too that kind of recuperates human dignity and, um, and the capacity for joy in the midst of a very dark moment. And in these ways, I think De Grazia's book really uh, exemplifies and shows us the imperative of historical empathy while at the same time illuminating our current culture wars without getting mired in them. So uh, with uh, Christian and Eric's permission, would it make sense for me to bundle my two questions and Vicky can just choose which one to answer? Go, go, go ahead. I think we have have a little time. Um, you know, you've prepared the questions and um, if they're uh, half as good as your wonderful comments, I think they're definitely worth posing. So please go ahead, Juliana. Okay. So um, the two questions that I have for you, Vicky, are asking you to basically put this book of yours, you know, your tour de force uh, book, here, your, uh, I don't know, beast performance um, in conversation with your previous works on fascism, post-war Europe and transatlantic relations. So my first question for you is related to how you see the arguments that you built in your book on the history of consent under fascism um, with, in dialogue with this book. How, if at all, do you feel your thinking on the question of consent under fascism has evolved over time? Um, and do you still see Gramsci's concept of hegemony as useful here? Or has your thinking on um, consent evolved in the many years since you wrote that, that book long ago? Gosh, that's a good, good hard, hard question, um, which, uh, that you pose. So just to, you know, the, 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 I think initially my idea of the consent was to say, I don't believe uh, you all, you out there who talk about the consent of people to fascism. In particular, this was a moment in Italy when um, historians were picking up this idea of the masses and trying to deal with it in a, let's call it a conservative liberal way to say that the masses, they basically for their own reasons that we don't really know well, uh, acceded to fascism for reasons we really don't know well because they weren't using social history to dig below. They weren't using um, even really good administrative or social welfare history to say why the people. It was a kind of notion that if you had enough propaganda, enough spectacle, enough marching around, and you didn't see resistance, except through 
handfuls of anti-fascist intellectuals, then there must be consent. So it was a very primitive notion of consent. So my whole operation was to come along like a you know, good social history and says, well, look, I mean, you, know, you, 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 you get rid of the, destroy the real outliers, the resistance, and you get a sense back of the people, who they are and what they're doing and why in the end, they would have an interest in either not, uh, in being either indifferent or being marginally oppositionalist uh, or uh, being not present. Okay, so, so it, was a, it was a very you know, democratic, social democratic vision, you know, trying to say no, workers, they didn't want it, uh, but you know, they're, they, you keep up a lot of, like a kind of resistance and sort of like this frisson that they're not participating. So that was one way. And then really as a you know, feminist, I moved to women and did the same, same operation. But there I saw hmm, really a lot were lulled by Catholicism too. So, you know, they're, they're, they can't, and, and I came up again, it was a structural idea that they can't really be part of the regime because they're not part of the regime. And if they want to protect their families in the end, structurally, they're going to have to be against the regime in the end. So in some sense, this was always ruled by some idea of mine, which went along with how we were feeling about people in, you know, in, in the 1960s and 70s, 80s, and everybody's against this, this you know, bad regimes and especially terrible dictatorial regimes. So this ultimately takes a different tack because it's dealing with elites. You know, and it, you know, I really am dealing with elites here. And, and they have this voice. They allow us to start hearing them talking about being close to Mussolini, to be this and that. And I think that it is true even while I, do, I don't have to say, look, folks, I'm not dealing with the workers here. I'm not dealing with the petty bourgeois here and so on and so forth. The fact that women are involved and the women are both saying, me too, me too, you are being bad. Okay, and there's a lot of this Manichaean view of fascism too, that it's corrupt or it's good, you know, bad, black, white, this kind of feeling, but it allows in a kind of juiciness, if you want, which seems then to raise the question, well, if we see horrible but full of heart here amongst these people, these elites, but also the girlfriends who may not be elite and, and who are in some ways marginal to the power structure, then it's going to lead us to question, to open up those questions, well, could 30 million Italians sort of find some sort of juice in all of this? Certainly, we know that in the Ethiopian war and so on and so forth. So it reopens the question of a kind of relationality. Uh, and it, 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 for me, I suppose you could say, well, first I look at the workers, then I look at the women, and now I'm put into this situation where you're taking part of the elite and you can see how a Taruzzi could be part, you know, the, the little tyrant, the local man, how he could be part of a chain that certainly goes to the local level. But then at the local level, I did find resistance, you know, that there was a lot of a fury in Como, Como's, you know, Manzoni's Como, I mean, the, the, the land of resistance, that there was agitation around you know, the corruption. But then what happened is people got very much involved in denouncing the corruption, in denouncing fascists as corrupt, denouncing individual fascists. So there's a huge amount of energy spent, and we know this from other colleagues, on denunciation. So on the small scale resistance, a small R. So I don't think that, that my emphasis on small R it changes significantly here, but it certainly does raise the question then, for example, a question which I don't address, how did, we might be familiar with from our times, how did people feel, let's say in 1925, when they could see that this regime was gonna stay? What kinds of feelings did they have? You know, what kinds of feelings did they have after incidents which said, hey, Mussolini shaken, God, you know, 1929, after the fall of Primo de Ribera, there's a lot of speculation that Mussolini would be next, and then nothing happens. How do they feel? And that, that whole question in this, how do, people, how do people survive 20 years, 20 plus years, 
thinking that Mussolini falls at 43 and then he doesn't disappear, so to speak, until 45. So there, that's Thank a you. long answer. Thank you, Juliana. Do we have time for one more? A quick question and perhaps a yeah. quick answer as well. <laughs> quick okay. answer, that's uh -oh. the key. <laughs> this is not a very quick question. <laughs> I'll, I'll try to ask it quickly though. Um, okay, <laughs> so, so the second question, um, thank you, Vicky, that, that was terrific. Um, my second question is really about the role of the United States here. So Attilio Terruzzi's first wife was the daughter of wealthy immigrants to the United States, as you said. Um, the question of U.S.-Italian relations comes up quite a bit in the book. The question of fascist attitudes towards U.S.-style capitalism, however, isn't quite as central. And I was wondering if you think uh, fascism's evolving political economy might have shaped some perceptions of Attilio's first wife, and in particular, whether the shift from kind of a free market fascism to protectionist autarkic fascism um, may have played some role in how Liliana was treated and mistreated by Attilio's entourage. Yeah, uh, I think you know, again, information is hard, it's hard to get, but 1929 was this, and, and uh, the, the, the stock market is still roaring when he, he uh, uh, such dismisses her, but there was a growing uh, ang anguish about the stock market and this, this Wall Street capitalism, which had invested so hugely in Italy as part of Italy's. And there was certainly talk about Jews being involved in that kind of speculative. So in 25 and early 26, when she was being courted, she was all yes, 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 yes. Yes, because she was full of talent in the American style. Yes, because Wall Street, she was somehow connected to, to, to that capitalism. Uh, yes, uh, because as Mussolini says, uh, we want to be friends with America. And uh, yes, because the war debt question was being settled at that very moment. And sh she certainly acted as if all that was connected to her. She was a very patriotic person. And she sees that again when, when she comes back and Lindbergh is visited. She's saying, you know, there's still, there's a lot of anti-Americanism. They think we're just the land of the dollars, but we, you know, look at Lindbergh. So her very, she sort of follows that, yeah, that's a, the hubris, American hubris of patriotism, going back and saying, now we'll go around the world, we'll act like Americans, and that will help you in your career. Not, not good in 1929. So there was a close connection. Another connection, let me, is, which is a little hard to read in because I was reticent about it, but she is the patriotic American in the end. And so there is something about her winning in the end, which you know, readers might, <laughs> you know, who loses, who wins in this in operation. But you know, I tried not to make, to make her more archetypical than stereotypical in, that, in this story. Thank you. Thank, thank you. Thank you so much. Um, usually at this point, at this point, uh, Eric and I chime in, but since I, I feel strongly we should get some of our view. Uh, a chance to pose a question. Let me call on Michael Novak to um, uh, who's in line to um, unmute yourself, please. While I do that, let me say that we will have Juliano Chamedes come back this spring. Yeah. Uh, hopefully, Eric, I'm not betraying any secrets here. We haven't uh, made it official yet, but, but if, uh, if you'd like to hear Juliana on her uh, book that was mentioned, uh, tune back in this, this spring. With that, over to Michael Novak for a succinct question and a succinct answer. Uh, th thank you, Mr. Osterman. I just wanted to ask, you mentioned, you mentioned earlier this idea of love and also this idea of love of nation love of battle comrades which is partially drawing on the fascism's use or misuse of the chivalric tradition i'm just wondering since mussolini seemed to be a big fan of invoking the legacy of the roman empire like was the ideology do you think fashion was sort of drawing on this like imagined idea of what rome was too or was that just window dressing thank you well thank you for that 
question, Michael, drew very much on it. Um, Tedruzzi was not such a protagonist, except, but that, how can I say that? <laughs> but however, however, being in Saranayaka, going out to see the ruins at Cyrene, he thought, I mean, they, they were in the Roman Empire. In other words, I don't think it was just a, a myth uh, or an image, but I think the distance in terms of years and possibilities shrunk radically, and especially when you went to the Libyan area and you saw these incredible Colosseum, which were bigger than those in Rome, that in Rome, or you know, Cyrene with its causeway, 12 kilometer causeway to the sea, and the idea that there were 100,000 people there and it fed Rome. So the, 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 the so-called myth of Rome is extraordinarily present. Uh, the names of all the militia are taken from the R Roman uh, nomenclature, uh, but in the militia codes, there was also a lot of reference to the sort of condottieri, the kind of chivalric traditions as well. Uh, the, the militia is especially then bound up uh, with that Roman legionnaire tradition, but also a tradition that continues with the idea of volunteer troops. And so they're building themselves a legacy and that legacy goes through 19th century Garibaldi volunteers and then back to Condottieri, the Renaissance defending um, the, the, the Italy against the, 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 the German emperors and against the Pope and then back uh, to, to Rome. What struck me always is how close that legacy seemed. It didn't seem like nostalgia or a past. It seemed like yesterday in, in, in terms of their pamphlets and their speeches and their uniforms and so on and so forth. There's some good work done on that Roman legacy as well. Joshua Cole, uh, uh, Joshua Arthur, excuse me, and, and, and some others. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, a question from Mary Pierce. Uh, thank you, Dr. De Grazia. My question is whether women in the lives of fascist high officials play any role in diplomatic processes and dealings. And then I'm going to call on Eric. Mm -hmm. Great question. We need a study <laughs> about the wives. Some did, like the wife of Federzoni, Gina, Jewish, <laughs> uh, at, at least. Uh, uh, Yes, and, and Catholic, uh, but Jewish background. She is very present in diplomatic activity. Uh, likewise, Margarita Sarfati was uh, in, in, in the 1920s. Uh, Liliana <laughs> accompanied her husband to, uh, to meet with uh, the, the engage in, in, in a, 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 a creating a sort of treaty, a peace treaty with the, the um, Senussi leaders in, uh, in Saranayaka. That was in the 1920s. In the 30s, it doesn't look like that except for, for Gina Federzoni, but he was no he was head of the academy. So uh, other, otherwise, uh, it, was, it was a very male kind of um, uh, core. Uh, the, the diplomatic core, of course, and very much tied to the regime, and so perhaps unusually masculine, uh, with with this very rare exception. Good question, though. Very good question. Mm. Thank you, Eric. This was a absolutely engaging read. Uh, it was one of those books that I had a hard time putting down. The question I want to ask has to do with Liliana and her relationship not to her husband so much as to Italy and to fascism. Mm -hmm. um, she is an American at this point, she's Jewish, um, and yet she's taken by this fascist world uh, and drawn in. So if you could just say a little bit about her, I guess the word is politics, mm -hmm. uh, and what fascism means to her. Mm -hmm. And then later in the book, after she is separated and after she has gone through such abuse, she distances herself on several occasions in the book from fascism. Um, you know, at one point uh, she she call, says that she's opposed to fascist principles, uh, and and later um, uh, she says. Um, you say that she found herself speaking out against fascism everywhere she went. Well, she says, I'm not getting nearly as many dinner invitations uh, and then proceeds to critique the church. So what in fascism attracted her 
and to what degree was she eventually repelled by it? Hmm. So I took it for granted that she was just an American Democrat with a small d. That was my point of departure uh, because I didn't notice the politics before she becomes involved with Teruzzi. And even then she's never talking about politics. But then when I go back okay, to 1920, to the, there she's scared to death of the socialists, especially mobbing people in the center of town. And her mother recalls, that, oh my God, this reminds her of pogroms. So there is so-called political instinctual that we're bourgeois in our furs and these people are waving their signs and thrusting them in our face. So, and then it, around her, she's hearing fascists. So probably very early, she adopts the local politics, which says of, of the bourgeoisie, the people she meet in her hotel, not the opera people, I don't think, but who are saying that this brings law and order. Fascism stands for law and order. It's a national party. It's against the Reds, okay? Which is what lots of people do also in the United States. And her father, who was a Democrat with a, probably with a big D, he clearly shifts around from having been against, he says that, you know, every, all the Democrats say that my friends in New York, you know, at the, at the club are saying that the, the fascists are bad, but now I'm convincing them that Mussolini is good. And that was a common feeling by 1925, especially with the debt settlement. Mussolini started to have a very, very good press in the United States from 1925 on. So again, it sort of goes with the, yeah. she says that she wants to help Italy, her adopted country. Okay, that's a kind of bourgeois line. She could have found it around the hotel. She could have found it around people, just generally Americans there. So she has this kind of you know, American in, in Rome, American in Milan approach. Now, she does not renege on fascism in, after she is divorced. She basically bl puts the blame on the church and then on Mussolini and his men. And she herself says in 1936, when she's in France, in the course of the popular front, she worries about the communist maid whose husband is the, sh the shop um, floor uh, uh, guy for the union in the, in the hotel. She says, I'm still a fascist. When she goes back to Italy, it's more ambiguous because she's clearly associating with Jews and others who are dissenters. Okay? And her, again, her major animus is expressed toward the Catholic church and annulment. When she comes back and says she's no longer fascist, ah, well, everything's changed. You know, the war, she's gone back to the US in 40. She becomes, you know, patriot. She's working for the censorship uh, uh, at the post office, using all her language. And when she comes back, she says, I'm an anti-fascist. I hate the church and all the people that still support Teruzzi and the church is the main supporter still of fascism. So it's a very, it's kind of a nice American trajectory, <laughs> what she's doing all the way through coming back to Italy in 46 and saying they don't appreciate what we've done. We shouldn't be giving them money. We should send it to, 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 the, to, to the Jewish settlements in Palestine. The Italians are ungrateful and so on. And after 47, she says, I just don't want to be here anymore. It's not the country that I like. Uh, and she switches her allegiance then to, 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 to to the monarchy and uh, the Queen of England and, 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 and Great Britain and becomes you know, philo, philo British. So it's a, it's a trajectory of change of, of a bourgeois woman who doesn't really know ever Italy well because she's cloistered from it in every which way. And most of her you know, knowledge is very circumscribed. So you don't get any you know, big thinking about Italy uh, in, her, in her letters. It's a very, very local. But you do see these people are all changing. You know, over 20 years, they make big changes in their, in their outlooks, sort of with shifts in world politics. And she's very emblematic of another trajectory uh, than, than clearly than what, what's happening in, in Teruzzi's uh, uh, existence, more German. And, and it's good. Thank you. I'm afraid we're coming to the end of our time here uh, with uh, really thanks, uh, uh, Victoria, for um, and congratulations on this book. Thanks to Juliana and uh, Sergio as well for late night uh, service here. I'll turn it over for some final concluding remarks to, to Eric. Eric. Yeah. 
Okay, thank you, Victoria, Juliana, Sergio, and Christian, and to those of you who have tuned in for this session. Please join us for the next installment of the Washington History Seminar uh, on Monday, uh, December 9th uh, at, uh, at 4 p.m. Um, for a session on the new book by Mira Siegelberg uh, entitled Statelessness, uh, A Modern History, this coming Monday. Uh, and with that, thank you very much.